Hello, I'm Mike Gould and I'm a writer and teacher uh, and I'm the author of um, Colin's uh, A Christmas Carol uh, Student Guide, which is a sort of companion to, to Dickens' great novel. Um, um, I've, got, I've got A Christmas Carol, a collection of stories with it in here too, and uh, we're going to be talking today about various ways in which you can um, encourage your students to get engaged with the novel and, and improve their learning, really. Um, so I'm going to talk about five tips that I I think you might want to consider in your teaching. Um, some of them will work better with some students, uh, some will work better with others, um, and I think it's really for you to make that judgment. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about today is um, this idea of Dickens, the writer, um, and the fact that he's able to bring together two things in his, his great work, which is that he can he entertains, but he also has a message. And that's kind of like not a particularly popular thing today. Uh, we tend to think of not many modern writers would um, start with a moral message. They wouldn't start by saying, right, I'm going to hit my audience by teaching them a lesson about something. They tend to start by thinking, well, I'm going to tell a good story. But Dickens with The Christmas Carol, of course, was very different. He did start with a moral message. He wanted to strike a sledgehammer blow, as I think he called it, um, to kind of wake up the country. And I think it's quite a nice idea to, to ask students to be Dickens for a day. In other words, if they were Dickens and they had a moral message, something they cared about, something they wanted to write about, how would they do it? So it could be um, provide more shelter for the homeless. It could be um, caring for refugees. Or, and anything, it could be a local issue. Um, if you could get them to think about how they would approach a story, um, how they would populate that story with settings and characters and a plot, um, I think it would get, help them to get inside the story either when they come to study it or after they've studied it to kind of reconsider how the whole thing would work together. Um, I think the message from it is, is that Dickens' best writing is... Uh, the secret of his writing really is that he's able to have this moral message and yet at the same time the characters are rich and the settings are rich so we don't feel we're being lectured and if students can do, do that even to a little bit it'll help them to, to, to get engaged with the book um, and I think that's something actually in, in, in the guide which, which we talk about a bit which is this, the mix between the moral message and, and, and the sort of the richness the tapestry of his writing um, I think the other thing which students find really difficult is the fact that this book is both simple and complex. On the one hand, you know, you can sum up the story in a few words. You know, a, a, a man makes terrible mistakes in his life and he is, he is, they are resolved through a process of visits from three ghosts and, and Marley before that. So, so structurally, in one sense, it's incredibly simple. And it can be reduced to that simplicity. But to some extent, that... that if we just reduce it to that, we lose all the richness around it. And so my second sort of tip is to think of, and this is kind of appropriate for the time of year, is to think of uh, the novel as a kind of Christmas dinner. So imagine that the turkey is, or maybe it's your veggie loaf or whatever, is the, is the main course. What is that main course? What's the heart of the novel? Well, it's probably Scrooge's redemption. But the Christmas dinner wouldn't be anything if it was just that main course. We need all the trimmings, we need the bits around it. So, you know, without stretching the analogy too far, what would the roast potatoes be? You know, how important, you know, is, is, that, is that Marley and the ghosts? You know, one without the other doesn't really work. But as for a bit of fun, but with a serious message, you can almost get children to draw a huge Christmas dinner with all the, the bits around it, and then right into that sort of diagram, it needn't be anything particularly colourful, you know, what is the main meat of the dinner, the story, and what are the bits around it, and how do they link together? Um, because there are some amazing things within there that we can easily forget, and some of the, some of the richest part of it, the, if you like, the tastiest parts of the story, are actually um, the, the things that on the surface maybe don't seem quite so important. You know, this marvellous Fezziwig's party, the rich, you know, gaiety and liveliness of that is, is, is wonderful. And yet we can kind of flip past it and say, oh yeah, well he goes and he kind of remembers that Christmas was pretty, you know, it, it was good in the past. But 
delving into it, the richness of the language is, is, is worth, worth looking at. So I think, yeah, so, you know, come dine with Dickens. That, that, would, be, that would be my message there. Um, I think another thing which um, is, is, is very important is that you know, we are, not surprisingly as teachers, obsess obsessed with the revision period and making sure that the students get the facts of the novel, that they actually know intimately the characters, the plot, the locations. And again, although it's a simple story, a, a lot of things happen in it which, which, which are difficult to, to grasp. I mean, just for one example, um, I just on the way up to, to, to do this event today, I was reading the book, reading the story again on the train, and I realised something about the time in it that I hadn't realised before, which was when, when Scrooge goes back to his old schoolhouse, when he's taken back there by the ghost of Christmas past, he first of all sees himself as a young boy in the, in the schoolroom, and it's incredibly moving. And I hadn't quite grasped that the ghost then takes him forward another few years to him being right at the end of his schooling. So there's, you know, structurally, that's quite a difficult little moment um, that, you know, even I've missed, even though I've written this book, these books, and I've read the story countless times, that little bit that he, he kind of, that being sort of fast forward in time, back in the past, w was complex. So one idea I think I'd, I'd like to think about is this idea of speed dating the text. So you can give your, and, and the reason for that is because it is complex, despite being simple. So I would give students a list of, of key moments. So it could be the moment when Scrooge is taken back to the schoolroom. That, that could be a moment. Or it could be Fezzi Week's party. It could be the final scene with the final ghost in, in the graveyard. And get each student to absolutely get to know everything about that particular moment. They become the expert on it. it you know, they, they know it as, as well as their own hand. And then get them to move around the classroom, uh, speed dating or meeting with the other members of the class, and they then exchange what they know about their moment. So they go around, they talk about Facebook's party, their, their partner talks about whatever they've had to learn about, and they move around, they keep on moving around. And in that way, they both hear more and they themselves are revising, rehearsing the, the bit they know intimately. And of course, through absolutely f focusing on that one bit for themselves, um, that may prove, have dividends if that particular passage comes up in the exam and then have to relate it to the whole text. Um, a sort of version of that, if, if, you, if you are confident with, with, with drama and you're confident with getting children, uh, students to, to act and rehearse, is you could actually get them to take a character. And so they could literally speed date the character that they'd learnt about. And that could create some interesting um, connections. Uh, you might have um, Scrooge's uh, uh, fiance, Belle, might have her meeting up with the ghost of Christmas yet to come. What would they have to say? Would Belle be saying to the ghost of Christmas yet to come, well, I always told him he was doomed, you know, um, and, and he should have listened to me sort of thing. So you could get them to become the characters and then they move out in character, in role, so sort of um, hot seating, meeting these other characters in the novel and talking about their story and who they are and what they've done. And I think that would be a, you know, a really interesting way of them, of them getting, getting to know each other and getting to know the characters. Um, so yeah, I think, think that would work very well. Um, I, I suppose a particular bugbear of mine, and this is one that relates both to uh, writing in English, in English language, and in responding to texts, is the way that students deal with uh, dialogue. Um, it's often overlooked. Uh, it's overlooked in their writing because um, I don't think they quite know what to do with dialogue in stories. They either write all their stories in dialogue and therefore it becomes kind of meaningless, or they don't include it at all. Um, and I think there's a kind of an important message uh, f from writers, which is that dialogue is always there for a reason. And it tends to be one of three reasons. One is um, to advance the plot. So um, you learn something which takes the story on further through the dialogue, the speech between characters. I think the second thing is you learn something about character. So it reveals something about a character or it endorses something about a character. So 
when Scrooge meets with Belle, his fiancée, or he sees his meeting with her in the past, as the ghost shows him, that's an incredibly important dialogue between them because it really shows how Scrooge became the miserly, cramped up, solitary, cold, icy figure um, that he becomes later in the book. And we need that dialogue to understand the man he's become. So you know, don't, let's not forget the dialogue. But I think the sort of the corollary to that is that when they do their own writing, encourage them in their story writing, if they're going to write narratives as part of their English um, exam, if they're going to include dialogue, make sure it has a reason. It's there to develop, the, I, I think there should have been a third thing, which is develop the mood or the tone. But predominantly, I think, to advance the plot or to embellish or endorse character. And if students stick to those two things and look out for that in, in, in the book, in, in The Christmas Carol, in, and indeed the other novels they study, then I think that'll be um, time well spent. Um, okay, my last sort of tip uh, that I want to talk about is in many ways the most important one. When students study books for GCSE, there's uh, a real tendency for them to be seen in a sort of silo, that they're, they're isolated, independent works. Yes, there's something about the context that comes through, but I think, and I know this takes time, so and it's not easy for, for you as teachers, um, but I think learning about Dickens, the agitator, the social reformer, is extremely important. But I think what's particularly important um, about it is not because it tells you about the context, um, not because it tells us that, so, uh, that Dickens was a social reformer or that he had these issues, but actually, I think particularly for the sort of higher levels, um, it allow, allows us to dig a bit deeper to find out what, what was Dickens the writer really like? Because A Christmas Carol, when we think about it, um, it could be seen to be a very sentimental account that we must help the poor um, and that the poor are possibly to be sympathised with, but also to be pitied. And I think what that neglects is the fact that Dickens also feared the poor, or at least he feared what society would do to the poor and therefore what the poor might do to society. He talks in a lot of his work, um, it, I mean, in the book there are these marvellous scenes uh, with uh, the children who represent want and ignorance, but those descriptions, they're not sentimental, they are frightening, they are terrifying. And actually, in, in, in The Companion, there's quite a lot on that, um, because I think it's so important. So I, I dedicated quite a big chunk of the book, book to that. Um, th yes, poverty is frightening, ignorance and ed lack of education is frightening, because we've got to remember that the French Revolution had only happened 30, 40 years previously. So the smell of rebellion was in the air and, and, the, and the ruling classes were frightened and Dickens is not, you know, and Dickens is not exempt from that. So I think children, particularly those of, in your class who you feel are confident, confident enough to capture that and to understand that, I think, um, should look more at Dickens, you know, what sort of man was Dickens, look into uh, what the book has to say about poverty. And I think part of that is then to, to read around the book. Um, Dickens, of course, wrote many brilliant other novels, but he also wrote um, non-fiction. He wrote, he wrote about his walks around London. He wrote essays, he wrote travel writing. And I think those students who have it in them to go away and to read some of those uh, other texts, and, and we do include some of them in, in the study guide, um, so there are some there for you anyway. But I think beyond that, if they can find them out for themselves, I think that will add to their sort of rich understanding of, of what, what Dickens was doing. Um, I think the final question is, is really, is, did, you know, did, did the Christmas Carol change anything? And I think when you're teaching the novel, that's a really important question. I, I'm not necessarily saying that students should write about that in the exam, but the idea, we started, I think, at the beginning of this, this, this session with me talking about the fact that Dickens started with a moral message and he ended up writing a book that we've remembered as much for its 
its rich characters and plot and uh, fairy story elements as we have for the moral message. But really, the moral message is still important today. Well, we know that after the book was finished, the Factories Act was um, reformed. Um, the age which children could work in factories was reduced, I believe, and the number of hours. It was still pretty appalling, but that happened pretty soon afterwards. There was also the repeal of the Corn Laws, which changed the working practices of many people in, the UK, uh, in England. So I think we can say that Dickens did create a sledge, it did bring down a sledgehammer, and hopefully your students will see uh, what those effects are and will be able to write about them in, in, in their essays in, in the exam. Um, I just wanted to end by saying that if you want to know more um, and to find out more about the books, but also uh, the other set texts, that you can go to the website www.collins.co.uk slash set texts. And obviously this will be there and as will be some others and hopefully that will, will, will help um, support, support your teaching and, and that of your students. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know if we, do we have any questions at all? No, um, we, don't. we don't have any questions at the moment but uh, you can leave comments and ask questions on the website and, uh, you know, and we, we can get back to you.